Hare Om Namaha. Judging an institution that purports to represent a Vaishnava line of disciplic succession entails an analysis of its past and current achievements, whether positive or negative. If we judge these in the right way, they give us evidence as to its legitimacy or lack thereof, leading to ascertainment of what the institution actually was and what it is. One of the key questions you need to ask yourself is whether or not the institution is the thing, is the most important thing, and whether or not it can ever be the most important thing in linking yourself to genuine Vaishnavism. Such an analysis is made in the context of whether or not those aforementioned accomplishments were in accord with its Vaishnava founding authority. Do the accomplishments coincide with the institution's original charter? Do they coincide, are they simpatico, with the intentions and expectations of the founder? The other key question you need to ask yourself is why is a constitution even needed for something that had been operating very well for many years without one? A drift from its original charter and directives produces unauthorized results and lack of accomplishment. If the institution was bona fide at its inception or conception, that authority would be its founder's authorization. That authority would be his devotional status, his power, his ethics, and of course his directives. If there are contradictions present to that in what was actually accomplished, that for certain is an indicator of deviation from the founder whether a new constitution has been created to hide this or not. Vaishnava teachings are the essence of revealed scripture. And a genuine Vaishnava line is part of a guru parampara or disciplic succession. If the institution was bona fide, its founder was a great guru in one of those lines of disciplic succession. He started his own branch. No newly created constitution for an institutionally centered entity is going to replace that acharya, the acharya in the true sense of the term, as he is light years ahead of that. He helps you to free your mind from maya, whereas the deviated institution with its ornamental constitution does not. Although uncommon, Sometimes a novel or a film begins with the ending. More often than not, it is a tragic denim way. This plot device is not rare despite the fact that it gives away the conclusion. Employing it, let us consider the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation. It is not genuine, but it emerged from a milieu in which its paradigm had been bona fide. In other words, what it was derived from many decades ago was the real thing. What it was derived from was not either a simulation or a simulacrum. The air quotes ISKCON institution is deviated. It is not actually representing the Guru Parampara it is supposed to represent. In its current iteration and over time as a simulation, it has never done so. There are many philosophical details involved in reaching this essential conclusion. You do receive some of these because you do receive in our presentations an explanation of Vaishnava philosophy, history, and practice. 
mostly what you receive from us is of the A, B, C, D variety, somewhat basic. Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, text 67, proscribes disseminating confidential knowledge further into the alphabet, so to speak, as such explanations are not to be shared with the general public at any time. The Internet is open to almost everyone in the non-communist world, but most of these viewers are not eligible to receive this kind of confidential knowledge. They are, however, eligible to be given A, B, C, D. Now, the aforementioned confidential philosophical knowledge is not meant for the non-devotee class. It is ineffective when given to those who are not living an austere lifestyle, and it cannot be given to those who are envious of the Parameshvara. These ineligible categories include most contemporary men and women of the world. It is to be expected that many curious or distressed people will watch our videos. That is the first reason why our presentations are mostly focused on what can be thought of as one topic, although in, in that focus we also discuss many related subtopics elucidated. The world at large does not realize that it is dependent upon Krishna consciousness in order to avoid degenerating into depravity and chaos. The actual fact is that Krishna consciousness, the science of Krishna Bhakti and all that pertains to it, is nothing short of the sum total and meaning of everything. This is not an exaggeration. Such is the realization of all spiritually inclined men and women, those who believe life is teleological, a special process, that it has meaning, that it's a rare opportunity afforded by entering this world in the human form of life within civilized society. It is known by some of our viewers that Krishna, Krishna consciousness, and Krishna bhakti, the science of Vaishnavism, is nothing short of everything, that this is a metaphysical transcendental fact. Delivering the tattva, siddhanta, and relevant parts of the particular Vaishnava history concerning so-called ISKCON is not outside the scope of any theistic Brahmin who decides to create an internet post. There is transcendental light and there is pseudo-spiritual darkness. Godhead is light and Maya is darkness. The Maya effects her most potent display of simulation in the form of perversions of Krishna consciousness. All of these constitute a descending octave containing many rationalizations. Although in due course they are all seen to be risable, later through the principle of the lag effect they move the world toward depravity, atrocity, and chaos. On the surface of the earth what is the institution which is a most powerful representation of such pseudo-devotion? Which has the most outreach? Which touches many nooks and corners of the civilized world in such a way as to quite easily mislead it into thinking that it is the real thing? These are all rhetorical questions. The answer to them is an acronym bracketed by quotation marks, so-called ISKCON. The fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation is the most dangerous institution on the planet at this time. Exposing such a pseudo-devotional entity 
is non-different from helping to spread genuine Krishna consciousness. Clearing clouds help humanity take advantage of all the healthy solar rays bestowed upon terrestrial beings when they come out of the shadows, out of the darkness. Prabhupada's branch of Lord Chaitanya's Krishna consciousness movement was the real thing in the beginning. In terms of how it was playing out at that time, it was not perfect, of course, because there's always smoke covering the fire in conditioned life. However, it was perfect enough, and its activities demonstrated in the form of its devotees' many accomplishments pleased the spiritual master, the acharya in the true sense of the term. As such, those actions, those sevas, under the working principles of Buddha Yoga, reached the Supreme Lord, the Parmeshwar. Another way of saying the same thing is that the activities of the devotees of ISKCON everywhere in the world at that time were completely spiritual, even though often performed very imperfectly. Prabhupada's movement had no egregor on the astral plane at that time. It was not functioning on the astral. It was functioning on the spiritual and devotional plane. Its actions, its sevas, and their results were in an ascending octave that broke through the Mahatattva because it was transcendentally genuine. Now, many of you heard this word apasa. The Sanskrit word apasa means semblance. When deviation enters into a spiritual entity or institution, when it does so, especially in a major way, that entity is gradually subverted into a semblance of what it once was. However, although it then slips into a descending octave, it is not that it instantly deteriorates into the most depraved way possible. That transcendental entity back in the day, Prabhupada's ISKCON movement, first got contaminated in an egregiously big way in the spring of 1978. Foreign elements had entered it previously and gained some traction, but none of that was as major as the zonal imposition of the pretender Mahabhagavats. As such, at that time, spring of 1978, the problem was no longer an issue of mere traction of an inimical thread within. There was instead, at that time, the start of a major transformation which Prabhupada could not reverse in no small part because he was no longer physically manifest to do so. The first transformation partially converted ISKCON into a perverted reflection of what it once was. But that was only the first stage. I'm going to be employing an analogy throughout this particular presentation, and that analogy is from the Mahabharata. You, most of you are aware of it. The battle of Kurukshetra was commenced with the Kurus as the heavy favorites. Like all analogies, this one's not perfect. For example, the sides were not even at the outset of that great battle, that great war. But that particular imbalance did not exactly apply to so-called ISKCON when the zonal era emerged, that imposition. Now, back to ancient Parthavarsha. The majority of kings sided with Duryodhana and his Kuru faction by a ratio of 11 to 7. The Kurus also had, unquestionably, the two greatest warriors on their side supplemented considerably by Karna. Vishma was the topmost warrior. No one on the side of the Pandavas could compare to him. 
and on his side, Drone Acharya, the great teacher, was there, but clearly in second place compared to the greatest of so many great warriors on the battlefield. The battle ensues, and until Bhishma is incapacitated by an Achilles heel, so to speak, no one would predict that the Pandavas could ultimately win with Bhishma leading the Kaurava army because he was devastating it. He was devastating the Pandavas. Bhishma's incapacitation comprised stage one. It marked a downturn for the Kauravas, no doubt about it. There are already hints that things were sliding downhill for them, but when Vishma was incapacitated, he did not die right away. Some doubt entered the side of his military party, which, as aforementioned, had been heavily favored. However, they still had Dronacharya, who was superior to everyone else on the battlefield, and confidence of the Kurus remained high. The battle continued, and Drona was proving almost as invincible as Bhishma. Yudhishthir, King Yudhishthir, at a key moment in the war, was incited by Lord Krishna, who was driving, who was the chariot driver for Arjuna, to lie. Yudhishthir was incited to lie to Dronacharya in the heat of the moment when Drona could not locate his son, whose name was Ashvatthama. Ashvatthama was also a great warrior. Yudhishthir did as Krishna ordered, ordered, and Drona, in a state of shock and lamentation, confident that Yudhishthir could never tell a lie, and hearing from Yudhishthir that Ashvatthama was dead, sat down on the battlefield falsely believing that his son had been killed. What had been killed was an elephant named Ashvatthama. Thus, one of the Pandava warriors broke military code and swiftly beheaded Dronacharya, although Drona was unable to defend himself, having cast his weapons on the ground. Confidence was no longer high for the Kurus after that. All of this marked the duration of stage two of that great battle. Karna then took over. He was at least equal to Arjuna, and Karna was an excellent military leader, considered as unconquerable as his great teacher Dronacharya, who obviously was no longer a factor. At that time, the Pandavas had Arjuna and Bhima, while the Kauravas had Karna and Shalya. Then, at another key moment in the battle, Karna's chariot wheel got stuck in the mud. Once again, warrior code dictated and was supposed to be observed that Karna would be allowed to replace his chariot wheel. But Krishna incited Arjuna to defy that code and to ignore it. While Karna was at the wheel fixing the problem and in no position to fight, he was slain by Arjuna at Krishna's behest. Now, there was no longer confidence on the side of the Kauravas because the next in command was inferior to the great Pandavas, Pandava warriors who still remained alive and well and fighting very well. The execution of Karna marked the end of stage three of a descending octave related to this heralded, heralded battle from millennia ago. Obviously, it led to stage four, the final stage, but Shalya was no match to the Pandavas, especially since his army was in dire straits, greatly outnumbered by this time. So Shalya lost in mortal combat to King Yudhishthir, who, although a great warrior, could never be compared to Bhishma, Drona, Karna, Bhima, or Arjuna. Now, how the analogy applies. Prabhupada's original institution has underwent three transformations in a descending octave beginning with the first one, which can be compared to the Bhishma Parva. It can also be referenced as so-called ISKCON at that time, as a new deviation had entered into it in a very big way. In early 1978, 
the air quotes Iskan Egregor created on the astral plane strengthened considerably. When the zonals took over, the fan was still strongly spinning, although its cord was then unplugged because of the transformation had taken place. Another way of saying the same thing is that many of the previously sanctioned and spiritual activities by the rank and file devotees continued to be actuated despite the major zonal contamination. And yet, although in the process of murdering it, the real movement was still able to more slowly and incrementally uplift Prabhupada's disciples at that time. Upon the emergence of the first transformation, the true movement and the competitor egregor were about even in terms of influence. Why? Because most temples still had bhakta programs, most still had brahmacharini ashrams, most still had initiates of Prabhupada performing the puja to the deities on the altars. Prabhupada himself was still held in high esteem and worshipped by all of the rank and file, his initiated disciples. His books continued to be distributed. When the pujaris were his initiated disciples, the foodstuffs they offered to the deities continued to be converted into prasadam. The Bhagavatam class in the morning remained the same for some time, although it was replaced by something else later on in some temples. The chief point is herein made. For some devotees, slow incremental advancement was still being made at that time. Those disciples of Prabhupada, and referring to all those who were Brahminical, were still studying Prabhupada's books and attaining transcendental knowledge and devotional realization. Apasa, as aforementioned, is related to a simulation, but it's not exactly a simulation. In other words, the movement became a partial Apasa, a perverted reflection of what it had once been. Nevertheless, the air quotes Iskan Egregor was not yet cent percent in control during the first transformation. Prabhupada's movement was functioning about half of the time, but in a deteriorating position. The first, this first transformation can be compared to the Bhishma Parva as per our analogy. Now, the second transformation, comparable to the Drona Parva, was not merely a perverted reflection. It was a mask, M-A-S-K, a mask. The newcomers from the previous transformation were taking, almost, were taking over almost everywhere. The chance for a genuine reform faded despite the fact that the second transformation was advertised as being that very reform. Let me assure you, it wasn't. Another irony of the second transformation was the noticeable manifestation that superficially it was an improvement, except at the Moundsville compound, and that for only a few years more, devotees in general were no longer under the oppression of so-called great God-realized God-men. The zonal arrangement and all the pomp and circumstances associated with it had been breaking down in the early 80s. And then it was finally jettisoned. The air quotes ISKCON movement of the collegiate compromise masked the reality more effectively than the first transformation. The root issues were not confronted. That mask was created in order to hide those root issues. The mask was meant to deceive the less intelligent, and frankly, it effectively did so. The movement remained an apas, but it was much more of a semblance. Its devolutionary momentum increased as it slipped further down its descending octave. 
However, all of these facts, all of this was hidden by its mask of so-called reform. The second transformation only superficially appeared to solve the problems. It did dispense with the ultra-oppressive high-flying zonals, but that imposition of the first transformation was already tapering when it expanded its numbers in the early 80s after a cringeworthy schism with Gaudiumut. All of this was not seen for what it was by the overwhelming majority of air quotes ISKCON leaders and acolytes. They wrongly believed that this mid-80s reform got their movement back on track and freed it from deviation. Let me assure you, it did not. Instead, it moved to a different iteration. But the mask of the second transformation hid this for a while. Over and above all of that that has just been described, this second transformation faced other formidable problems. One of these was already ongoing years previously, and we're talking, of course, about Neomut. The second transformation totally rejected and rightly so, the Bengali slogan of Mutguru Si Jagaguru. All the gurus in so-called ISKCON were now rubber-stamped by the GBC as Madhyam Adhikaris, or supposed to be Madhyams. Another way of saying the same thing is that the Uttama Adhikari worship was abandoned, although there was a contradiction here, more on this point later. Tatvamasi. At the time of the second transformation, Neomut was able to pull out stalwarts from the air quotes ISKCON movement. Neomut's argument was that the guru must be seen by his disciples as a Mahabhagavat. That was in contradistinction to the new tact of the second transformation. So-called ISKCON lost some of its heavy hitters who bought into Matguru Si Jagaguru and they crossed the river and joined Neomat. They took with them many rank-and-file devotees, people who wanted big-profile gurus to follow. Another negative development came down the pike for the leaders and beneficiaries of this quote-unquote new and improved movement. What was that negative development? You've all heard of it. Ritvik. At the fag end of the 80s, Ritvik emerged out of Mississippi quite unexpectedly. The second transformation had been relying upon the crutch of reinitiation. Its gurus, predictably and increasingly, grossly fell down some of the time more often than before, the new initiates were stampeded by reinitiation propaganda. They were strongly pushed and joined to get reinitiated. Some of those former newcomers wound up with three replacement gurus or even four. This eventually appeared to them as ludicrous as it was already known to be to almost everybody else. But Ritvik offered an alternative. You could be initiated by Prabhupada. Oh yeah! He would never fall down. And Ritvik propaganda began to seep into the transformed, air quotes, ISKCON movement. De facto, this put an end to the reinitiation tactic which had been effective for a few years previous to the emergence of Ritvik heresy. Although the initial proposal from Ritvik was that the GBC could only, only the GBC could appoint Ritviks, the vitiated GBC rejected the idea, so that olive branch fell flat. Even many virulent, air quotes, ISKCON critics your host speaker included, 
rejected heretical Ritvic rationalizations and exposed them. It served as another kind of schism. An abortive effort represented by the Vaishnava Journal in the early 90s attempted a better late than never alliance with Neomut in order to team up and tamp down Ritvic. Team up against Ritvic and tamp it down. However, that effort of the Vaishnav Journal could not gain any traction for a variety of reasons and was soon abandoned. Neomut would remain inimical and that became a stone-cold lock. Ritvik ostensibly tried to reform so-called Iskand, but all of its overtures were rejected having never been taken seriously. Indeed, your host speaker helped to ensure that outcome by writing and distributing a position paper against it, the first such position paper of its kind, in February 1990. This let the leaders of so-called ISKCON know that even those handful of devotees who rejected the second transformation were not influenced by the Ritvik concoction. Instead, many of us were strongly opposed to it and have remained so. The West Virginia despot was also a problem for the second transformation. Moundsville did not cooperate with the second transformation, but made heavy propaganda against it. The numbers at the Moundsville compound swelled because its former zonal continued to accept Uttama worship there. Indeed, when a peace contingent from so-called Iskan arrived for talks with Kirtan Ananda, it was treated quite poorly. It did not know that the Vanity Fair despot had instructed his men to treat it like the Rotary Club. Another problem with the collegiate compromise of the Second Transformation was obviously its tendency towards compromise. It did so with those who, unlike Kirtanananda, remained loyal to the vitiated GBC. The West Bengal Zonal was most prominent in this connection. He was allowed by the governing body to continue to accept Uttama worship on the plea that his Bengali acolytes would not be able to stick to him if he did not do so. All of this diluted the alleged integrity of that transformation, in which everyone was now supposed to act as regular gurus, no longer accepting exalted names and exalted worship. Why allow for any exceptions? However, the second transformation needed acceptance and that means it needed numbers. Now, all of these above-mentioned problems for the Second Transformation were formidable. All of them were undermining it. As time wore on, its flaws became apparent. However, all of these obstacles combined, those just delineated, did not constitute the killer problem for the Collegiate Compromise. That killer problem was R-E-V-E-N-U-E, -E -E, revenue. You see, by the time the Second Transformation had dug in and was, so to speak, the law of the land, the air quotes ISKCON movement was constituted mostly of newcomers at the rank and file level. This also soon became the, ca became the case for its temple presidents. These new people were all improperly initiated and improperly trained. Analogously, the Dronaparva, the second stage, was not as strong as the heady era of the Zonal Acharyas, the first transformation. Most of the air quotes ISKCON temples required heavy monthly expenditures in order to be maintained. This meant that they were, for all practical purposes, dependent upon the pick. However, 
many if not most of those collectors were no longer enthused enough to engage in such a heavy austerity of ripping off the carmies on the street or in the malls. Some simply said, no mas. Others continued, but with the gusto that they were used to engage, no. And the revenue flow everywhere in the West took a substantial hit. Those out in the pick needed their bogus Mahabhagava to enthuse them. But he was now gone. The fan stopped spinning during the second transformation. Most of those improperly initiated people could no longer get jacked up enough for hitting it out in the field, for picking the bone and bringing it home. Most of them were burnt fried and deep fried by all that had gone down. They were black pilled by all of the changes. The pick was a tough gig and it required more than prosaic determination. The second transformation took that away because it took the high profile gurus away. During the first transformation, all of those new people with many Prabhupada's initiates also, could and did get fired up in order to please the so-called God-realized leader, the God-men of their temple. This gave them strength to endure the slings and arrows of the pick for 14 hours every day. Once the second transformation took over, all of that was gone. With it, the revenue that those true believers used to generate evaporated. This slowing of the money flow from the pick would lead to increasingly tougher times in terms of temple expenditures. It also crimped the lifestyles of the new leaders who were the chief beneficiaries of the second transformation. This problem was the big one. Combined with the other problems which I've delineated facing the second transformation, in due course Everything was ripe for another transformation, another change. In other words, it's, the mask was now ripped off. Both of these aforementioned Abhasa transformations can be categorized as simulations. They were imitation processes of the actual process established by the Acharya in the true sense of the term, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. There was pretension and deception involved in both the first and second transformations. The third transformation is the current one, although it seems to be coming to an end, hopefully. The third transformation is also a simulation, obviously, and it slides further down the descended octave begun in 1978. The third transformation is an illusion. It's called the Hinduization of so-called ISKCON. Although there appears to be a relationship, the actual fact is that Hinduism has no connection whatsoever with Krishna consciousness. Hinduism is a third-order simulacrum of hardcore Shankara Mayavad, which is opposed to theistic personalism. Mayavad is quite pervasive in all branches of Hinduism. The so-called common factors between Hinduism and Vaishnavism are all banal. Both are vegetarian movements, although many Hindus are not at all strict about this. Both accept the principle of deity worship, both are originally of Southeast Asian origin. Most of Hinduism accepts the Bhagavad Gita as an important book of revealed scripture, while this is emphasized in all Vaishnav lines. Both can be called Vedic, although ultimately this gets hashed out differently on a granular level. Yet, the hard and sharp fact remains that Hindus are not Vaishnavs. 
If a Hindu is a Vaishnav, then he or she is not a Hindu, simply a Vaishnav. The lines have some preliminary intersections at a very base level, and this distinguishes them from the Abrahamic religions and other non-Vedic religions, all of which are entirely useless. Hindus can be considered Vedic only in a very generic sense. Ultimately, such is not the case. Consider the following seven excerpts from Prabhupada, in all of which, via letters to his disciples, he exposes Hinduism for just what it is and for what it is not. In a letter to an early initiated disciple dated November 29, 1968, quote, Regarding the Hindu community, don't expect anything very wonderful from them. You cannot expect any cultural contribution so you will tactfully deal with them and, whenever possible, vehemently protest against their foolish ideas. But you should try to support your statements on the strength of Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. Best thing will be to avoid them as far as possible." Unquote. In a letter to a leading secretary dated November 3, 1968, quote, We find in India the so-called Hindu are doing all sorts of nonsense, so practically the whole world is without religion. Officially, they claim some sectarian identification." Unquote. In a letter to his first initiated disciple dated June 10, 1969, quote, Perhaps you know from the very beginning, I never describe my movement as Hindu religion. Religion means the bona fide process and the first class religion is that which teaches people to develop love of God." Unquote. In a letter to a temple president dated April 17, 1970, quote, regarding the Hindu centers in the foreign countries, none of them are bona fide. There is a similar hodgepodge center in London. Everyone of the Hindu community in the Western world has got some very good feeling for me because superficially they are seeing that I am spreading Hindu religion, but factually this Krishna consciousness movement is neither Hindu religion nor any other religion. So even though the Indian Hindus are very much inclined in my favor, so far I have experienced, it is very difficult to turn them into pure devotees." Unquote. In a letter to another temple president dated October 26, 1970, quote, Regarding worship of demigods, the whole Hindu society is absorbed in this business. So unless our preaching work is very vigorous, it is very difficult to stop them, unquote. In a letter to two prominent disciples dated February 4, 1972, quote, Actually, this Hindu religion is a dead religion. This Hindu religion has no philosophy. Therefore, it has died, because in this age, people have become very much hardened by material living, and they are not much into, interested in sentimental religions like Hinduism." Unquote. In a letter to an Indian disciple dated April 27, 1974, quote, other than the bona fide Vaishnava functions, we cannot divert our devotees' attention to such participation in so-called religious functions. This has spoiled the Hindu religion into a hodgepodge pseudo-religion. For advancement in Krishna consciousness, we should simply concentrate on Krishna." Unquote. So let us summarize the points that Prabhupada is making in these excerpts from his letters to leading secretaries, presidents, and disciples. Here's the summary. Hinduism offers no cultural benefit to the Krishna consciousness movement. It is best to avoid Hindus. It is sectarian and not real religion. Prabhupada's movement was never meant to be described as Hindu. 
Hinduism is a hodgepodge pseudo-religion. It is difficult to turn Hindus into Vaishnava devotees, which logically means that Hindus are non-devotees. Hinduism is absorbed in demigod worship. Hinduism is a dead religion and a sentimental one also. Now, despite all of these criticisms, his warnings about dealing with this Southeast Asian smorgasbord and its followers, the warnings weren't heeded when the third transformation was implemented shortly after the turn of the century. The Hindu camel got its nose under the tent and went right up and in. It uprooted the tent and turned, air quotes, ISKCON, that institution, into an illusion that was actually a branch of Hinduism. Since the superstructure was already there for the taking, the Hindu took it. Hinduism was already infiltrating the centers in India and London from before that time, as that was much easier, obviously. At the, outs, on the, at the onset of the Third Transformation, it then did so in the rest of the West. The mask of the Second Transformation came off completely, and the Hindu hodgepodge took over, subverting so-called ISKCON into a Hindu illusion. Particularly in the West, as aforementioned, the pick was drying up when the Second Transformation disillusioned its own rank and file. The Hindus provided revenue, and it was a symbiotic relationship. So-called ISKCON provided them ready-made temples and beautiful deities. It was great for the Hindus while tamping down so-called ISKCON as it analogously degraded into the Karna Parva. The Hindu dance troupe became a regular function for temple entertainment. Hindu marriages were performed in front of the deities. Hindus took over temple presidencies. It even got so ridiculous that in at least one center, car puja was introduced when a new vehicle was purchased with temple funds donated by the Hindus. Now, a little bit of history. For those of us who were active in the movement before the transformation, the first transformation, we all remember, as long as our memories have not been warped and distorted, we all remember that Hindus had no influence whatsoever in the movement. They never attended functions except the Sunday feasts and even then sporadically. They'd drop a fiver in the Donna box and then they'd leave. No one catered to them because devotees in the Western centers knew it very well that those people were not meant for being cultivated as active members. They were not interested, and we were not interested. They were not disrespected, but they had no presence and no influence. Prabhupada promulgated his movement primarily in the Western countries, beginning on the East Coast of America. His movement was meant for Westerners developing Krishna consciousness. Even his temples in India, which were started later than the initial centers in America and Europe, were populated and run by Westerners in the beginning and middle phases of their operations. The fourth transformation, analogous to the Shalya Parva, will not merely be an illusion, but it will degrade into a full simulacrum. This means that it will become only a representation of something, a complete imitation of what that something once was. The real Hare Krishna movement will be unrecognizable in it. <laughs>
colossal hoax known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation is a pseudo-spiritual scam. The institution is not the thing, and it can never be so. Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra is the important thing. What hath so-called ISKCON wrought? It has forged these accomplishments. They are the first transformation of the pretenders, the second transformation of the collegiate compromise, and the third transformation of the Hindu hodgepodge. Throw in their new constitution, and you have four concoctions as their chief quote-unquote accomplishments. You are enjoined herewith to free your mind from all of it and from their bad association. However, if you fail to do as just advised, at least recognize that you're not entitled to bellyache about it. If you do not heed these warnings, you set yourself up for disillusionment. In other words, do not whine and moan about what a bummer it is for you when you throw out the baby with the backwater after being black-pilled. Sadeva Samya.